You are listening to Living the Clover Life. Hello and welcome back to Living the Clover Life. In this series, we'll be talking about overcoming the deadly sins. It's getting close to Halloween and there's a full moon. So what better time to start talking about the deadly sins? Should I talk like that the whole time? Absolutely. I, 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 it's always how I imagine you talking about it. Well, let's start then with the prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. amen. Heavenly Father, send your blessing upon us as we meet you in spiritual combat that we are engaged in, in this visible world all around us. Continue to give us the weapons that we need and help us to know our enemy. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, as we get into this series, uh, we're talking about spiritual combat and then kind of a little bit of about the deadly sins. We'll get more into depth as we get going with them. Of course, sin is is missing the mark. It's an archery term where we're trying to aim at something, but we don't quite get there. And so when we talk about things like spiritual combat, we're trying to know how do we aim better? How do we develop ourselves in a way where, where we're making real progress? And it's just not, we're not meandering around trying to figure out how do I get to, to be closer to God? And so we got to know things like know our enemy, you know, know his tactics. We got to know the weapons that we have at our disposal. What is God giving us? And then we have to know ourselves and how those two things interplay. And the deadly sins are, are the primary manifestation, right, of the enemy's right. victory in our life. The deadly sins are, you know, sometimes uh, seen as these seven deadly sins that are chief sins, other sins flow from them. And it's not that they're uh, only a sin in and of themselves. It's almost like a mode of sin or, or a way of sins. Like a bunch of different sins can come under that that way of uh, sinning. And very often in our culture, at least, they're they're romanticized and sensationalized. Like oh, pride, lust. You know, there's this this kind of sensational way in which they're presented as somehow attractive. But mm. at the end of the day, all when we enter into this, we enter into death. Well, and sin is always put forth as being attractive. Right. You know, what does what right. does Satan say to to Eve? You know, look at the apple; it doesn't look good. You yeah. know, you'll get some knowledge from this. A sin's always put forth as as attractive to us. Yeah. And so, on the other side of the Hollywood spectrum are things like scary movies and how you cannot get out of of sin. Like like Satan has this this big plan for your life. And, you know, we see the, the possession movies where mm -hmm. the deadly sins have taken over yeah. and there's just no way there, of getting out of these things. And of course, that's that's, again, part of the sensationalizing of the deadly sins in so many ways. Well, that's how Satan gets you, right? He, he sensationalizes deadly sin. And then once you have entered deeply into it, it's like, now you're mine, right? Mm -hmm. He speaks that lie that somehow now you can't escape and you're enslaved. The, traditionally, the, the deadly sins are, are these, these seven sins categorized as different, again, ways or modes of sinning. They are pride, anger, lust, envy, gluttony, avarice or greed, and sloth. They didn't arrive, like you say, Father. Yeah, they they didn't, didn't fall out of heaven and will glad like that. Exactly, Father's favorite expression. But but they were developed over time as sins that kind of were the chief sins, the head sins from which other sins flowed. They damage relationships. They have an addictive quality. We're, we're drawn into this in sort of a, a sense of worshiping ourselves, uh, worshiping what we want, worshiping our desires, but ultimately being enslaved by them. But again, they didn't come out of heaven in a gladlock bag, like here's the list of, of the enemy's tactics. So what we want to do today is kind of dive into how these, these this list came to be and how the church came to understand what the, the chief uh, deadly sins ended up being. Yeah, so let me start by laying a little bit of a, a foundation. So in the early church, you know, there's, there's persecution and Christians are really striving valiantly to, to live the Christian life and to take on a virtuous life, to live a life of grace and all of these sorts of things. After Christianity becomes legal, then, then some problems begin to seep in, like a certain apathy, a, a certain like sliding into heaven 
And there are certain people that feel called to go and live once again the Christian life heroically. Mm -hmm. And these become the desert fathers, people who, who live out in the desert and they're trying to grow in the spiritual life. Uh, and there's two sides to that. You know, you're trying to grow in virtue, but you're also trying to root out vice. And so they spend a lot of time thinking about these things. What is the human condition? What is the human heart drawn to? Uh, and where are we, we going? So we, we get these hermits, especially in Egypt. It's mm. from which we're going to get things like the Benedictines. They're going to kind of start living in communities later on. Uh, but but they, they live out in the desert and they're trying to really kind of discipline themselves physically, their appetites, but also their, their emotions, you know, trying not to get pulled into things like depression and anxiety and dysfunctive moods. And then also to keep their, their mental minds sharp away from things like jealousy and envy and boasting and just kind of being prideful overall. So we have uh, St. Evagrius P Ponticus, who is uh, a desert monk, and he starts to kind of codify certain overarching categories for sin, where he talks about gluttony and prostitution or fornication as a, a category, avarice or greed as a category, sadness. And uh, interestingly enough, he, he kind of calls sadness uh, where envy is going to begin to be born out of, which is kind of a sadness over somebody's uh, for good fortune, wrath. And then you have like achadia and dejection. He talks about boasting, pride or overcoming, overestimation, arrogance and, grand, and just being grandiose in general. <laughs> so he's got all these kind of categories that are starting to come together. But then... Then in the West, over some time, St. John Cashin begins to take what he had and to even make it a little bit sharper, pull things together. So you've got, he has gluttony, but then lust and fornication, uh, greed, sorrow or despair, despondency, he puts all together. Then he starts to talk about wrath and then sloth, vainglory, and then pride or hubris. And as time goes on, they, they kind of pare this list down. Like initially, they're just like, well, what 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 are the different manifestations of, of kind of chief sins? Like if you were to follow each sin back to its kind of core uh, violation, what would it be? And that, that list kind of gets more refined and more refined and more refined as you go on. Also, it's worth pointing out that the early church... Uh, it was hard for them to come together and discuss things intellectually because Christianity was illegal, right? They couldn't publish books and have discussions and, and enter into that dialogue about philosophical and theological matters. But now that Christianity is legal, it's possible to do that. Well, and also people are going to these, these fathers of the church to try to learn how to grow in the spiritual life, almost yeah. as like spiritual direction. They're going right. out and they're hearing what they're, they're saying, you know, avoid these things and you will come into a, a life of grace or be more open for a life of grace. I think the other thing about the desert fathers and desert mothers is that they're out there in the middle of nowhere with very little worldly connection. And they're still finding that they have sin and temptation isn't, in their hearts. Isn't that interesting? Because a lot of times people will say, you know, this Christian thing would be easy if it weren't for all the people, <laughs> right. right? And even they, out living by themselves, find themselves struggling internally with things right. like pride or lust or, or a desire for for things right and i think that that is also a way in which they're able to refine it closer and closer to the heart of the matter because they can't blame it on you know oh just this interaction i had with this other person or, or whatever it might be although they did have interactions it was something that kind of arose even from within their wounded spirit and they were able to see things in that light and that's a good point because a lot of times we want to push our sins off on circumstances it was their fault <laughs> yeah it was, it was they made me mad yeah. you know they they did this to me and and that's why i'm all, all wounded and so they they give us a key insight as to what's really going on in our hearts and getting to know our hearts is really what spiritual combat is really all about so by 590 AD, St. Gregory the Great is going to be the one who comes up with the list that, that we're pretty familiar with today, 
that, uh, that St. Thomas Aquinas is going to speak about mm-hmm. when he writes his Summa Theologiae later on uh, in the Middle Ages. And he'll kind of start calling them the capital sins. Yeah, and capital comes from the Latin capitus, which means head. And, and these are the, the head sins from which all other uh, sins in their category kind of flow. He also talks about uh, individual sins as being kind of more serious or, or, or more at the core of all sin than others. You remember in the book of Revelation, the the beast with the seven heads and the seven crowns. I mean, it just kind of draws you into thinking about, yeah, these are, uh, there's something very particular about Satan and his plan of these seven heads, these seven uh, areas that we tend to struggle with or from which a lot of our other sins stem from. Right. And so if you can go at the the head, you know, because if you're going to kill a snake, you can't chop it off like at its body somewhere down below, or it's just going to come back and keep atta- uh, stay alive. You got to attack the head, and that's right. kind of what the this whole tradition's about. Is you might look at certain activities, sinful activities in your life, and be like, "Well, I'm trying to get that," but really, there's something deeper. Right? There's something that I need to go to the the heart of or the head of, and and all of our our Christian images and imagery and and narratives all kind of get at this you got to go to the heart of the matter and destroy that and at the head of of the the head sins or the head of the, of the deadly sins saint thomas aquinas talks about pride as kind of being the the nexus of all sin or the mother of all sin all all sin kind of flows from pride uh, pride can either be a manifestation of us seeking to be something that we're not or present ourselves as something that we're not or to, to again, make ourselves God. Now, let me go back to those images and imagery once again, because there's a, a great, great tradition. And I know you know what I'm talking about. It's the Divine Comedy by Dante. Everyone knows that, Father. <laughs> <laughs> and it's in the three parts of the Inferno, the Purgatorio, Purgatorio and Paradiso. The, and Paradiso. And so he's writing about these layers of uh, of hell in that inferno, and it really does kind of begin to go through some of the the deadly sins, and gives us this image of like this is the, our descent down into hell. Yeah, this is one of I would say the three most famous poems uh, in the entire canon. You have uh, the Odyssey, the Iliad, and Ancient Greece, and, and potentially also the. the uh, uh, the Aeneid, so maybe maybe four, but then you also have Dante, uh, who is this master poet from the Middle Ages, who writes this story about a soul's journey through life, going down into the depths of hell, up through purgatory, and ascending to the mountain uh, of the Lord. And that journey is very poetically described, but it comes out of this larger tradition of Christians thinking about different sins, different manifestations of human weakness, and some of the the consequences that may come along with that. It's not a theological work as such in (laughs) terms of precision. He didn't have a divine vision of what hell looked like. Exactly. (laughs) Although many people did think that this was actually a vision that he had that he recorded. Uh, It was, it was not in any way that, but he, he does a great job of kind of, at least in, in metaphor and in story, helping us to think about the effect of some of these sins. So as we go on throughout this series, we're going to talk a little bit about Dante and kind of his uh, perspective on these sins and what it what it would mean. And because again, he's coming out of this larger tradition of the saints thinking about these these things. And I would say he, I mean, he's largely about spiritual combat. Why is he showing us this? Why is he reflecting on this? He, he wants us to help to to engage in the spiritual combat. We got to know thy enemy, know his tactics. So we got to think about what what makes a sin deadly. Um, And we might kind of distinguish something like, you know, well, we we hear about mortal sin Mm -hmm. and mortal sin, of course, is something that is grave matter. We know that it's wrong and we freely, willingly choose it. But for something to be really deadly, it means that 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 sin is is of a such a grave matter that it is pulling us into a, a spiritual death. Yeah, it's pulling us into deeper sin. Mm-hmm. All all of manifestations of a deadly sin is like a a seed of death that breeds more or grows into more and more death in your life. So you know, if you give into the sin of pride, you become more prideful, and manifestations of pride give you uh, excuses to do all the the evil things all the things that you might be drawn to that are that are not good 
or, or maybe lust, you start thinking about people in a way that you shouldn't. And then that uh, grows into uh, disrespect for others' um, boundaries or maybe looking at pornography or, you know, it just grows deeper and deeper and deeper. So these sins ultimately lead to death. Again, that's that's where we have this, this concept of of deadly sin. And primarily, they usually lead, if they're, if followed, they lead to mortal sin because, well, this sin isn't so bad. Right. It's not so bad. And you justify getting into graver and graver matter. And that's that's kind of the clear thing. You know, a lot of us were ready to excuse little actions. Oh, it wasn't so bad. It wasn't yeah. so bad. But this is how the devil gets us. You know, he convinces us that he's not there or what we're doing really isn't that bad. Uh, there's kind of this analogy I like to use where if you, you, took a boiling pot of water uh, or pan of water and you threw a frog in it, it would hit the water and it jump right out. But if you set that little frog in a cool pan of water and on a stove and you turn the heat up, it will sit there and literally boil to death. And, and, and that's kind of what happens with us when we're not paying attention to sin in our life. It becomes uh, very deadly, very quickly. We just kind of slowly boil to death, so to speak, in the end. And that's, of course, what Satan wants to do. He wants to, to kill us. He wants to kill our relationship with one another, with God, with ourselves, because misery loves company, and he is just miserable. Mm. But the good news is God wants to pour his life into you, and he's got a beautiful plan for your life. And he has something called uh, the virtuous life that, right. that he's calling us to, to take up. And along with the, you know, the life of grace and the strength of grace, living the virtues is what our main battle plan is. So what is virtue, Nathaniel? <laughs> well, virtue comes from uh, initially the word vir, which is the word for man in ancient Latin, and then it became virtus. So it's kind of like this, this manliness. But again, you, you have to understand that their understanding of, of manliness wasn't True, ex- human. Right. To humanness. be truly human is what it means to be virtue. So virtuous. So what, a, what an animal might manifest, like you have a lion that appears very brave. Well, it isn't virtuous because of choices it's made. It, it's acting on instinct. Right. Humanity, uh, we're the only ones who can act on, on will out of choice in a way that is thought through, thought out. And, and, and there's merit in it because we've made the choice for the good. And so this, this virtue that we're talking about, virtue is a habitual and firm disposition to do the good, the catechism says. That means that it's not just like, a, I did a good thing, I'm being virtuous. Well, <laughs> that act in and of itself may be virtuous in some manner, but virtue itself, a virtuous life, is a life lived with the habit of doing the good. For example, you know, we all walk, or hopefully all of us, walk out of church on Sunday, and we look out in the parking lot, and we see, oh, there's a bunch of cars out there. Our first thought probably isn't, oh my goodness, there's so many cars I can steal. This is awesome, <laughs> right? But <laughs> but someone who's caught up in this, 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 uh, this thieving mindset would see every single car out there and assess it based upon, well, how easy is it to steal? You know, how uh, much money could I get out of it? All of those things are, are are ways in which you would you would not want to be thinking. But most of us are virtuous on the level of not running around stealing other people's stuff. And it's interesting to think that you go back to someone like the Greek philosophers, Aristotle and his Nicomenean ethics, and there's just a very natural sense of this uh, when you you go into this of what are what does it mean to be virtue? What is a virtue? It's this good way of living and taking it on as a habit. But we as Christians say the life of grace adds something to that, adds a power right. to it, where it's not just me white knuckling it or or conjuring up as much energy and strength as I can. But, you know, the the Lord of Lords fights my battles and he pours strength and freedom into me. And freedom is for doing the good and choosing the good. It's not for just doing whatever I feel like or whatever uh, co- passion comes my way. And of course, we see how that goes horribly wrong when we just follow our passions and we think that that's going to make us more free and it ends up enslaving us uh, more so than before. And, you know, you think about that. It's like, well, do you have a vice in your life? Uh, try to break that. You have a good good habit in your life? Try to break that. Which one's easier to break? It's always the virtue. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, sla- uh, sin addicts us. Sl- sin enslaves us. But God came to give us grace, to set us free, 
to be able to live the virtuous life, not not as a burden, mm. but with great ease and gladness and joy and to pour strength into us and opening our hearts to that becomes one of the quintessential ways of living the spiritual life and the spiritual combat. And virtue ultimately always leads to happiness. Mm -hmm. There are some tough choices along the way, but our life is always better. And because we're meant to live as as humanity, right? And, and again, be, to be virtuous is to be fully human. One of the keys with growing in virtue is delaying immediate gratification. Mm -hmm. You know, you you foresee a good that is down the line. You know, I could I could do this thing now and I'll, I'll get a sense of gratitude, but if I delay it, uh, I, I can get more, uh, something better later is right. the concept. It's like, it's like feasting and fasting right. Right? in our Catholic tradition. Yeah. You can appreciate great food more because you're not always stuffing it in your face, right? If you delay a gratification, the payoff is, is oftentimes better. Also in just in our base humanity, there's a thing called buyer's regret, right? Anytime you make right. a big purchase, there's always like, oh, shoot, did I make the right choice? Right. Giving yourself time to acclimatize to, you know, I've, yeah, I'm making this choice intelligently and diligently. It's something that we have to, to sort of remember that part of our broken humanity is to, to question uh, the goods that we seek even if they are indeed good. So ha imagine how much more regret there might be if we ended up choosing the wrong thing, actually. Yeah. And so the antidote to these deadly sins are going to be virtues like chastity and temperance, and generosity, diligence, meekness or patience, kindness and humility. And they, they line up, the saints have seen as the opposite or the remedy to uh, the, the deadly sins. But again, I want you to keep in mind that it's, it's not about you white knuckling it. It mm. really does. They come alive through the life of grace in you, uh, and by an openness to God's grace that we're able to practice these virtues as a remedy for sin in our life, for the deadly effects of sin in our life, uh, and to f ward off and fight temptation, uh, in the long run. So one of the ways we also have to think about the uh, fight against sin is calling upon the Lord when we're tempted. Yes. So, so we're going to, as we go through this series, talk about holy habits or maybe some, yeah. some weapons yeah. to, to put in your armory. And so holy habit number one is when you're tempted, seek the Lord, mm -hmm. cry out to the Lord, use temptation. And remember as a... the Lord is present to you at all times. He yes. is right there. So when you call on him, it's not like he's got to run down from heaven. He's right there right. at your disposal. And he's not waiting for you to impress him. He's just waiting to, to for a way he can assist you. An invitation. Exactly. And so, so when you're tempted, use that as a trigger to call upon the Lord and say, God help me, Mother Mary, come and assist me. Uh, and that in that we are using temptation as a trigger for holiness, as opposed to temptation to be a trigger for Satan's victory. Kind of like if you think about, you know, I don't know if you know any martial arts like uh, judo or aikido, where you're using <laughs> you're using the enemy's energy or momentum against him. That's kind of what in in the spiritual life, a discipline we need to grow in is using every occasion of sin to be a reorientation of us towards the Lord and crying out to him to save us because he's, he's our savior and he loves to save. Yeah, this is going to be a fun series. So we hope you join us next time when we'll be talking about fighting pride and envy. And so until then, keep overcoming the deadly sins and keep living the clover life. You've been listening to Living the Clover Life. For more information about St. Malachi Catholic Parish, check out our website at stmalachy.org, S-T-M-A-L-A-C-H-Y.org.